Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Today I'm reviewing an HO scale SW1200 locomotive from Rapido Trains. My model is detailed and decorated for Southern Pacific. Rapido offers this model in two versions. The MSRP for the DC version is $225. The MSRP for the version with DCC and sound is $335. I paid $272.99 for my sound equip model from modeltrainstuff.com. We'll start the model at 100 possible points. The model comes in a sturdy cardboard box. Inside is some documentation and stickers. The operating manual includes a brief prototype history, information about operating the locomotive on DC or DCC, warranty information, and some of Rapido's usual attempts at humor. A two-piece plastic cradle surrounded by foam protects the model. Thin plastic film provides some additional protection against scratches. The box also includes a small parts bag. My model arrived missing one of the rotating axle end caps. Unfortunately, unlike scale trains and some others, there aren't any extra end caps included. I'm sure Rapido will replace the end cap, but I still don't think a brand new model should have missing parts, so I'm taking five points. This is a good box that should protect the model for storage and transport. My model of SP2285 represents an SW1200 from an order of 17 units delivered to Southern Pacific in 1965. These diesels were originally numbered from 1607 to 1623. The switchers did not keep their original numbers for long. In 1965, as part of SP's general locomotive renumbering, the units in this order were renumbered in a series from 2272 to 2288. They retained these numbers until most of the units were retired in the late 1980s. A few lasted on the SP into the mid-1990s. Many of these ex-SP switchers went on to have careers on other railroads. My unit, 2285, went to the Richmond Pacific in 1986. According to trainweb.org, the unit was eventually renumbered 85 and lasted on the Richmond Pacific until 2019. I compared the model to photos of SP2285 and many of the details are generally correct. I applaud Rapido for modeling the switcher without footboards, as that's how they spent most of their careers. Unfortunately, the model is not without errors. Rapido modeled the inverted T-style fuel tank that is correct for SP on these units, though some of the details on the sides of the tank are incorrect. There should be no additional detail on the fireman's side. The engineer's side should only have a gauge and it's in the wrong place. It should be closer to the middle. Despite the errors, the overall look of the SP-style fuel tank is good. This is a difficult part to find or make if you were trying to kitbash an SPSW1200. I'm a little uncertain about the horn. The bell configuration looks correct in some photos of SP2285 and incorrect in others. The MU stands on the ends are the incorrect type, and the one on the front is on the wrong side. On the sides, the lift rings should be simple rings, not the more elaborate type as on the model. The red on the front should wrap around the end of the hood a little farther. By far the worst error, though, are the triangular plates near the corner steps. The ones on the model are much too small. This is an old Proto 2000 SW1200 shell with the triangular pieces modeled correctly. The Rapido model is off by a lot. I did some research and this was not just an SP feature. SW1200s on other railroads also had the larger triangles. The smaller triangles on the model appear correct for some Canadian Pacific SW1200 RS units. This would be an extremely difficult error to correct and would require a partial repaint of the sill. Combined with the other errors, I'm taking 10 points. The paint on the model is opaque. The separation lines between the colors are sharp. The markings are crisp and free of voids and the small writing is legible with magnification. The handrails are flexible enough to stand up to moderate handling. It looks like the side handrails might be metal with plastic stanchions. The stanchions on my model are straight. I like the freestanding grab irons on the side of the hood. The trucks don't have brake lines but those were not too visible on this style of truck. In front the model has a photo etched fan grill. Some weathering would probably make this look more like the real thing which had a much more see-through appearance. In photos, the grab iron across the front grille is painted white, not red as on the model. The unique SP light package is nicely done. The drop steps are operable. The pilot has uncoupling levers and hoses. The uncoupling levers are out of scale. The bars should have a much thinner cross section. It gives an otherwise detailed model a toy-like appearance. Given that many other models in this price range have uncoupling levers that are more delicately modeled, this is a miss. I'm taking five points. The cab has wind deflectors. Photos of the real 2285 show armrests and sunshades. These parts are included in the parts bag. The cab has a full interior, which is especially nice on this type of unit where the interior of the cab is visible. 
The model also has windshield wipers, separately applied grab irons, and another SP light package on the cab end. On the corners, the steps have see-through perforations. Up top, the model has photo etched radiator screens, though there doesn't seem to be much detail underneath. Looking down into the model, I can see wires. The SP style number boards are nicely done, though it's disappointing that they don't light up. The antenna on top of the cab appears to be plastic and looks like a broken part waiting to happen. Metal might have been a better choice for the antenna. Underneath, the detail is fairly basic, but there's enough there to look good when the model is on the rails. All of the axles are powered and all the wheels pick up current. The model has rust colored knuckle couplers on both ends. I'm looking for the horizontal center of each coupler to match. The front coupler is high, so I'm taking five points. The rear coupler is passable, but sloppy because the knuckle is drooping. All the wheels are engaged according to the NMRA standards gauge. There is no body wobble. The model weighs 10.6 ounces. I measured a peak drawbar pull of 2.2 ounces on my force gauge. An average HO road diesel pulls about 2.5 ounces. This model should have plenty of power for a switcher. I'm running the locomotive on DCC. I haven't changed any of the default decoder settings. The model is set to address 3 from the factory. F0 turns on the headlights, which are directional. The front light is on when the engine is set to move forward, and the rear light turns on when the engine is set to move in reverse. F7 dims the headlights. F12 activates switching mode. This is supposed to light the headlights on both ends, which it does, and dim them, which it does not. It just flashes them once. Doing this also disables the gyro lights and emergency lights. F13 turns on the gyro lights. These are also directional. F14 turns on the emergency light on both ends simultaneously. This does not disable any of the other lights. I'm showing them on by themselves to make it easier to see. The ground lights are on by default. F18 turns them off. F16 turns on the cab light. It seems too bright, but that could be fixed with some decoder programming. F8 turns on the sound. F2 sounds the horn. F1 rings the bell. The horn can do a long or short toot depending on how long the F2 key is held down. Wait a minute, that horn sound isn't right. Using information in the manual, I reprogrammed CV163 to 2. Now it sounds more like an SP engine, though the horn sound is distorted. I'm not sure if that's an issue with the speaker or the sound file. The manual says that F4 turns on the dynamic brake sounds, but SP's SW1200s didn't have dynamic brakes. F9 activates the full throttle feature, which allows the prime mover to notch up or down independent of the locomotive's speed. This is good for simulating starting under a heavy load or coasting. F10 is supposed to be an independent brake, but it doesn't work. When you press F10, the locomotive doesn't stop. I've had this issue with other Rapido diesels. It can probably be fixed either with some CV programming or by loading a new sound file. I really think Rapido should have gotten this right so that the model performs the way the manual says it should. I'm taking five points. Reworking the triangular parts near the steps is a big project and beyond the scope of this product review, so I'm going to leave that alone for now. Likewise, changing the uncoupling lever is something that I'll leave for another time. For comparison, this is the same style uncoupling lever that I custom made for Akato NW2. The wire lever looks much closer to scale. I prefer to use KD-158 couplers. I'm going to swap out the factory couplers and make any adjustments necessary to the coupler height. The first step is to put the engine in a cradle upside down and remove the coupler screw. Then the entire draft gearbox assembly will pull out. Mine was a tight fit, so I had to wiggle it a little to loosen it. The draft gearbox fell apart after I removed it. I won't need the coupler spring for the whisker couplers I intend to use, so I'll remove it. This is a KD-158 coupler. It fits into the factory draft gear box. Now I can reinstall the box. When I removed the rear box, it had some oil in it. I can't recall ever seeing another HO scale diesel come from the factory with oiled couplers. I'll clean mine out before I install the new rear coupler. Now the front coupler is a little high. The rear one is just slightly high. I'll need to shim the gearboxes to lower them. Since the front pilot is actually tilted back slightly, a shim alone probably won't work. I'll need to file the rear of the coupler mounting pad on the chassis to level it out. This is a shim I made from O20 styrene sheet. It'll fit on the top of the draft gear box. Since the fit is so tight, I'll also need to file some material from the bottom of the hole in the pilot for clearance. 
The coupler shim is barely visible after the coupler is reinstalled. This is KD Part 211, which has O10 and O15 gearbox shims. Since the rear coupler wasn't off by as much as the front, I'll try the O15 shim. I'll need to trim the unused mounting holes on the sides. After both couplers are reinstalled, I'll check them again. The front one looks good. The rear looks good too. The parts bag includes armrests, sunshades, and drip rails. The instructions don't mention any of these parts. The sunshades and armrests have pins on the back that look like they should fit into holes on the cab, but no holes are present. No drilling template is provided. Looking at photos, the drip rails on SP SW1200 stuck up above the cab slightly and the sunshades attached to those. If I attempted to put these parts together like that, I doubt they would last long. I've decided to hold off until I can find some more durable aftermarket brass sunshades. The armrests also don't look quite right for SP. I'm going to leave those off for now too. Personally, I'm disappointed in the number of issues with this model. I have no plans to buy another one. Let's see what we've got. My model had a missing axle end cap, so I took five points in the packaging category. The model had one major detail issue and a number of minor issues, so I took 10 points in the prototype accuracy category. The uncoupling levers are grossly out of scale, so I took five points in the paint and detail category. One coupler was at the wrong height and the brake function doesn't work as advertised, so I took 10 points in the standards and operation category. That leaves us with a total of 70 out of 100 possible points, which would be a C- on a report card. This model has some good features and some significant flaws, so I'm giving it a yellow signal. Whenever I do a review like this, it seems like there's some people who think I was too hard on the model. Maybe some people won't be as bothered by its flaws as I am, but I find it really disappointing. Thanks for watching.